Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted uh, to have this event today here uh, in, in the e e European Sustainable Energy Week. And today we are going to show us in a different way uh, how improvements can be made in energy efficiency uh, through technological cooperation. So first of us, we want to introduce ourselves. We are the ENI CBC Med. We are the European Neighborhood Instrument for cross-border cooperation in the Mediterranean. We are an EU program fostering cooperation with Mediterranean neighbors, uh, which uh, for the 2014-2020 period, we have funded 80 projects, uh, 80 cooperation projects worth uh, 209 euro million in 11 different priorities. And we are acting in 13 countries. Uh, seven of them are EU member states, and six of them are Mediterranean partner countries. All those projects, must include partners from both sources of the Mediterranean to uh, assure a proper cooperation. And one of these priorities uh, was energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, applied to buildings. And why buildings? Uh, because according to data from the European Commission, buildings in Europe are responsible of 36% of global final energy consumption and 40% of total direct and indirect CO2 emissions. So, improving the energy efficiency is mandatory uh, in the energy transition, especially in southern countries where uh, building a stop has a great room of improvement. Uh, among those projects, eight of them have been funded in this priority, energy efficiency. And they brought together more than 50 entities, including municipalities, local energy agencies, and universities with more than 18 million euros invested. So today we will show how six of these projects have performed cost-effective energy renovations for public buildings. We will travel to three different uh, sites to, to uh, witness uh, inside, okay, uh, live online, uh, what some of those projects have achieved uh, to perform energy re renovations. We will also hear the testimonial of a young researcher on career opportunities in the energy se sector, since we are in the European Year of Youth. And based on what we've seen, we will discuss some policy recommendations uh, for a greener buildings in the future. Today, we are holding this event in collaboration with the Global Alliance for B B B Building and Construction, which is the leader global platform for governments private sector, civil, so civil society research, and intergovernmental intergovern intergovern organizations commit to achieve a zero emission efficient and resilient buildings on the construction sector. With 250 members, uh, including national governments, they are a big player, in, and we are glad to have today here uh, Andrea Voigt from Danfoss, which is an energy company providing energy efficiency solutions which is a member from the uh, Global ABC. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, does that work? I think so, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, um, Alejandro. Thank you for the introduction. And it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to be here in person. Um, it's really energizing and uh, vitalizing to see people once again in 3D and not in 2D anymore. It's also great to have such a big topic, um, the, the energy efficiency, which is really right now, I think, more important and more relevant than ever. And the beauty of this project now is, is here now is to really showcase how this can work in action. Energy efficiency on the one hand side, renewables on the other hand side. No competition by any means, but really two solutions that must complement each other if we want to really achieve this big challenge that we have ahead of us, which includes both um, getting uh, carbon neutral um, according to our climate law in Europe, reducing by 55% the greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, but also, and importantly, guaranteeing energy security for everybody um, in, in Europe, for all of the citizens. So, so I think this is a great opportunity, and I'm very happy to be here um, on behalf of uh, the Global ABC and also on behalf of uh, Danfoss Climate Solutions, where I'm heading uh, Global Public Affairs. So welcome everybody again. And um, with this, I will hand over to um, Nora Steurer from uh, the Global ABC, um, who will take us through the latest um, 
the, the latest findings from the flagship report uh, that Global ABC is doing about buildings, the so-called building status report. Nora is a program officer at the United Nations uh, Environment Program. She's based in uh, Jordan, so she's not here with us uh, in person, but here with us on the screen, and I see her uh, smiling. So with this, I would hand over to Nora and uh, look forward to hearing uh, about the latest findings related to buildings. Nora, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you, unfortunately for me, in 2D, not in 3D, even though I would really love to be there. Um, as Andrea said, uh, it's a real pleasure to do this event together with Danfoss, together with all of you at this European Sustainable Energy Week. And what I would like to do is provide a little bit of a global framing, some global facts and figures. Some of you may already be well aware of those, um, just to provide a sort of framework for the exciting projects that we will hear afterwards. And indeed, uh, it comes from our global status report for buildings and construction, the 2021 version. Note that we are we will shortly release the 2022 iteration on the 2nd of November, so I cannot yet share the data from that, but do stay tuned. If you're keen to learn more, you're very welcome to also attend the launch event. I'll give you more information later. So with, without further ado, um, if you could uh, start the presentation for me, and uh, then I will take you through those facts and figures. Thank you. Good. Um, I can only see it half, but uh, I think we'll make do. Um, okay. For um, you can go straight to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so um, why buildings? And uh, Alejandro already uh, alluded to it. And as I said, I'm sure many of you or most of you are already convinced of the need to work on our buildings now more than ever, as Andrea also said, with the energy crisis, with soaring prices, there really, uh, there really is the question, why not, not why? Nevertheless, um, adding the global perspective to the European ones, uh, to the European one, we know that approximately uh, every five days another Paris is constructed in terms of floor area. So I always like to use Paris because actually I'm technically I, I am based in Paris. I'm back from Jordan. <laughs> so and Paris is a wonderful, wonderful city, uh, as as those of you who who know it know. But it really shows the magnitude of the challenge, but also of the opportunity. Half of the buildings standing by 2050. 2060, depending on the model you're using, have not yet been built. So we have the opportunity to get it right. And it really is one of the most cost effective uh, solutions, but also one of the ones with most job creation potential. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, to, to this point, we know that for energy efficiency investment into buildings and construction, actually nine to 30 jobs are created for every million dollar invested. And that's massive. It's actually much more than many of the other sectors that you could invest in with either energy efficiency or renewables. And 60% of home retrofits in Europe of this expenditure actually goes towards labor. So there really is also this job effect, this employment effect, also very important in times of economic volatility to be made here. Next slide, please. I'll go through this quickly because Alejandro said it so well already. This is just to give you context of the global ABC. We are hosted by UNEP. You can see it from our background and we really have this aim of bringing the building sector to the forefront and putting it on the spot when it comes to climate action, for which obviously energy is paramount. So if you're keen to join, do contact us. Next, uh, next slide, please. And if we just uh, go a little bit, you know, we heard about the, the massive um, impact in terms of floor air growth, in terms of uh, economic potential. So what do we want in terms of emission reduction? So for the Global ABC, we form part of this Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action. I know it's a mouthful, but basically it's a forum that assembles all the all the ones that are not countries, if we will, and uh, together we formed a pathway that is much more comprehensive than what you see here. But the emissions reduction goal globally for buildings is that by 2030, we need to have emissions 
um, and we need to have 100% of zero carbon in operation. So this is obviously energy. And by 2050, we must decarbonize along the life cycle. So energy is paramount, but let's not forget that for full decarbonization, we need that life cycle perspective and we need those goals to be Paris aligned. Next slide, please. So now I would like to just talk to you. These are our activities, and I won't some, say much more about this besides that we do track progress, as Andrea has said, through our global status report for buildings and construction, and we support countries through building decarbonization roadmaps. I want to give you a snapshot of the global status report for buildings and construction. Some more facts and figures. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is a graph that we did last year and we find that it got quite a lot of attention because it compares the years 2015 when, it, when we were founded, the global ABC, and also it was when COP21 happened, so Paris Agreement, and 2020. And I think what's important to see here is we do see progress. So let's not forget that we do see progress. There is a massive challenge, a massive opportunity, all very, very true, but we do see progress. And I think it's important to remember that, to know that we have things that do work. We see a massive increase in terms of countries that include buildings in their NDCs, nationally determined contributions, a massive increase in terms of countries who now have building, building energy codes, whether they're mandatory or not is another question. We also see a massive increase in terms of investment, uh, almost 40%. It's not enough. It's not enough. But we are making progress. Next slide, please. Um, but there is another big but in my mind, which is we might, we are making progress. The direction maybe is right, but the speed is not. And what you see here is like this little on the left hand side, this little the graph where it looks to me at least like a snake that's rearing its head. You see the, the zero carbon goal by 2050 we need. And then the little snake is basically where are we now? And then we zoom in and we see in 2020, it actually looks as though we are on track. But that is because of COVID. So let's not forget we had a very strange year. Um, that is now behind us, although maybe COVID is not yet. Um, and if we uh, calculate out the COVID effects, the fact that a lot of construction projects were on hold, we are actually not on track. We're really not seeing the speed that we need. The gap between the, the zero pathway by 2050 and where we would need to be to be on track, this gap is widening. So we need to be a lot faster. We need to see a lot more of that progress that I just mentioned. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot on uh, building codes, and I mentioned them earlier. Um, obviously, there is a massive amount of regulation that we need to see globally and in Europe, um, and I won't say everything because it's a complex issue, as we are all well aware. Just on codes, I mentioned earlier, we see a massive increase. That is very, very good. But if we take a little bit of a closer look and we distinguish between voluntary codes and mandatory codes, there is a lot of work to be done. Only a minority of countries have mandatory building energy codes for all buildings, residential and commercial in place, it's between 20 and 30 percent. It's really a minority. It's better in some regions in Europe. You can see most of them are mandatory. In MENA as well, not most. It's 44 percent, but it's better than the global average. In Africa, where most of the future construction will actually take place, it's only 9 percent. So we have a massive, massive need to scale up this fundamental pillar of regulation. Next slide. So after this gloomy message, a message of hope, again, nationally cont uh, determined contributions, actually we see that energy efficiency improvement in buildings is the most popular measure in NDCs after renewable energy, alluding to Andrea's point, they need to be complementary, not being in competition, but it's a hopeful message that this is really, it is getting more and more on the forefront, this issue. Next slide. And now I will talk to you just a tiny bit about the roadmaps that we're doing with countries. So you can go straight to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so at the Global ABC, we are also working directly with countries and really with the ministries. We do not just want to do something that then sits in the drawer and is not being used. These are all really happening with and through relevant ministries on roadmaps. And we have developed these with input from over 700 stakeholders globally with eight categories to really say it's not just about the building, it's about the building in its context. So we need to have goals and priority policy and technology measures met 
in all of these eight categories, urban planning, new buildings, existing buildings, operations, appliances, materials, resilience and clean energy to have a truly sustainable buildings and construction sector. And yeah, as I said, we have priority measures for 2030 and 2050 and all of those. And if you go to the next slide, please. After having done um, regional roadmaps for Asia, Africa and Latin America, completely recognizing the, the diversity of these vast regions, we're now breaking these down to the national and sub-national level. And we are very pleased that a lot of our members are taking these and they're starting to just run with it a little bit like a franchise, if you will. These are in the public domain. Anyone can use this model. So, for example, the United Arab Emirates, they're now using our model to develop building decarbonization roadmaps for 22 um, uh, jurisdictions in the Arab League um, and we're seeing this take up more and more. You can see here the little uh, the little pillars in regions where these roadmaps are happening, as I said, always with and through relevant ministries and jurisdictions. And with that, you go to the next slide, please. That's my final one. Um, with that, I'll stop. I just, just gave you a snapshot. Of course, there's many, many more points to be made, and I'm so, so excited to hear of the fantastic projects in the Mediterranean regions following this. Uh, I, will re I really would like to thank you for listening. If you'd like to find out more, do visit globalabc.org. You can join us very easily. We welcome new members, and you can contact us at global.abc.un.org. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Andrea and Alejandro. Thank you so much, uh, Nora, for this uh, introduction. I think there is no better way to set the scene uh, than with the status report and with the great work that uh, Global ABC uh, is doing. But what is even more exciting is that we will now really go to the, to the substance of things and hear um, five very successful uh, stories on how energy efficiency and renewables are being put in practice uh, in the Mediterranean region. It's great to have you all here, um, and it's great to hear really first-hand uh, experience from your different projects. Uh, the first um, speaker, if I'm not mistaken, will be uh, Lucia Ramirez, um, who is an architect at the Valencia Institute of Buildings. And she will put the focus on the so-called BEEP project, which is all about building information management systems in, the er in energy efficiency in the public sector. And just um, to say the, the beauty of what you're going to hear is that each of those projects will zoom in on another aspect. So you'll really get a very global overview of what can be done in terms of making our buildings resilient and efficient. Floor is yours, Lucia. So thank you, Andrea. I will try to, okay. Just to give you an overview of the project, the B project is being for energy efficiency in the public sector. And it's dealing with um, a public, uh, with energy retrofitting of public uh, heritage buildings. Uh, the main result of our project. Uh, mm, okay. I don't know if the, okay. The main result of our project has been the development of a methodology for public administrator, administration, who is usually the manager or owner of these uh, type of buildings, and is based on two concepts that I will explain. Uh, building information modeling and energy performance contracting. Uh, right now, what you're looking at in the background is a public heritage building and it's building information modeling. Uh, this methodology allows to centralize in a single digital model all the information of a building and it's uh, strange because until recently this methodology was only used for uh, new buildings. But however, uh, heritage buildings are far more complex and include much more extensive and comprehensive data. And this is why the application of BIM to heritage buildings which is the so-called uh, heritage uh, building information modeling, is a breakthrough. So the traditional B model has been the three-dimensional geometric model of a building, but the evolution of the B methodology 
uh, has made it possible to include uh, new, dimen new dimensions and a BIM model can now include information on time, um, cost, environmental and maintenance information. A model including all this data, um, in the case of a heritage model, is called Energy Efficiency Heritage BIM model. And the purpose of this model is to, f is to act as a kind of a repository, uh, centralizing all the information of the building, and it should become a kind of an upgraded model with all the energy information of the building, with the goal to show uh, how energy retrofitting measures um, work uh, in, in this building. So, uh, this upgraded model uh, aims to, to become the tool to be used for the management and realization of energy retrofitting. And in fact, the left diagram shows the B project workflow and how this model becomes a central tool to be used for the financial plan and the design of the energy retrofitting interventions. Well, in fact, the, the B project has not only paved the way for um, the methodology being used in heritage buildings, but also uh, for energy performance contracting. Uh, through this financial mechanism, uh, the renovation expenses are, expen are ex uh, expected to be covered by the energy savings achieved, and they should be estimated prior through this central model prior to the renovation. Well, in fact, the, as you have seen before, the process of creating a BIM model, uh, including historical information, energy analysis information, and financial, financial data is quite complex. And that's why the, the BIM project has aimed to summarize in a synthetic and a comprehensive way uh, this process, including all the steps to be followed by the technicians in an, an easy and understandable way to make the process understandable for everybody. So the guide developed is one of the main results obtained in the, in the B project and brings together the, the results of three years of work. And it presents a workflow which goes from the building analysis, the energy analysis, the design of the interventions, and the whole intervention, including the financial part. Uh, this guide is, avail is available for free download uh, you will see the link in the next slide. And the main goal of this um, project is to enhance the capacity of the public administration when it comes to renovating the public heritage buildings. So here you can see that furthermore, this methodology has already been tested in nine pilot buildings located in seven different uh, Mediterranean countries. Um, in fact, also, the, um, it has been quite successful, and the results as of this guide will be, um, um, will be replicated in other Mediterranean regions through another project, also from the ENICBC MEP program, which is called the SICAP for SDG program uh, project. <laughs> so this is a little bit the motivation, and which uh, Alejandro already explained. And by way of, of, our, of farewell, and since I'm speaking about buildings, I will explain you a bit about my organization, which is the Instituto Valenciano de la Edificación. And we are working as the innovation agency for our regional government. And we are uh, approaching um, the building sector from multiple perspectives. So in case you're interested, I invite you to visit our website. And thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Lucia, for taking us uh, to public heritage buildings, a very important aspect, and showing also the power of digital and what can be achieved with the right programs in place. So with this, I hand over to Gian Nicelli, who takes us to Italy, Cal University of Cagliari. Cagliari? I don't know. I don't <laughs> Okay, and not, um, not Calgary, Ireland, Canada. <laughs> 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 who will speak um, about, uh, who will take us a little bit more into the renewable energy side mm -hmm. of things and uh, will tell us about the Berlin project, although this is not in Berlin. <laughs> no, the acronym is of the title, the title of the project is not related to the 
exact titles, that is uh, cost-effective rehabilitation of public buildings into smart and resilient nanogrids using storage. So the, the motivation has been already said by Alejandro and Nora presentations, so the building sector is a high cons energy consuming. So it has an enormous uh, efficiency potential to be attacked. So uh, um, in order to, to achieve this goal, uh, we test uh, as a solution the application of nanogrid concept to public buildings in order to build some pilot projects, some pilot installations in different countries <coughs> and test these, uh, um, these solutions uh, in order to uh, understand also their applicability in different uh, situations. Um, the concept of the pilot is quite, quite easy. Uh, in the building we integrate some uh, devices like photovoltaic plants typically on the rooftop of the building, battery storage, install the automation for the, the, control, the management of loads, and all these devices together with uh, some measurements uh, uh, installation for weather and uh, for ambient uh, control are <coughs> received by a central energy management system that have to manage all the resources, understand the status of the building, and control the charging and discharging phases of the battery and eventually also manage the load of the, of, of the building for the goal to increase uh, the cell consumption, so increase efficiency and reduce the bill of the, of the building. As said, uh, we have preparing uh, six pilots installation in four, in four countries from Italy to Greece to Cyprus and to Israel. Uh, the building are, uh, in, in our case, for, from uh, the Cagliari University, is uh, a building of the campus. For uh, Israel, there are uh, two schools. From uh, Greece, we have uh, uh, the dormitory of, uh, uh, of the campus and uh, a, a building of the town hall, and also the research center at the University of Cyprus. Uh, here you see uh, the pictures from the installation. The, we are finalizing the installation in this month. We had some delays due to the procurement of the devices uh, uh, due, to, uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in our case, to, to, uh, to, uh, to have the availability of the battery, we have to wait uh, eight months from the uh, closing of the tender, for instance. So there is some delays about that. But I think that uh, by the end of the year, so the pilots are started to run, and we so in the next year we, we, we can show exactly the numbers and the results of this project. Uh, on parallel to this pilot installation, we're also developing some supporting tools uh, in order to uh, clearly to make easier the application of these solutions, and to show and demonstrate the efficiency, the, the, the effectiveness of this. Uh, uh, of the solutions and uh, help the, uh, the, the, insta the installation. It, uh, now it's already available uh, a first tool that is this, uh, s an online software for sizing PVMS, so uh, photovoltaics and storage, uh, that take into account also the control of the, of the demand and also the, um, the different kind of uh, local tariff, energy tariff, uh, and uh, weather conditions in order to design the, 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 the better, the better the in the better way this kind of solutions. Other tools, other uh, applications that I, like policy maker tools or uh, guidelines uh, will be produced uh, in, in the next months. Uh, so I, I think that uh, I'd stay in this five minutes and that's all for me. <laughs> that is in itself an achievement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Gianni. <laughs> so much about the building itself as well. The building itself acting as, a, as a really a self-sufficient entity nearly. And that also shows the power that we have in improving things there. So now I'm um, traveling to Greece um, uh, to uh, Marina Kauta, who is an uh, engineer at the University of Patras. 
and who will tell us everything about the green building project, yet another angle to buildings. Marina. Uh, not everything in five minutes, but I'll try <laughs> to say <laughs> some tips and uh, highlights. <laughs> okay. Let's start. Uh, Andrea introduced me, so I will move on. Uh, our project aims at reducing energy consumption and adverse environmental impact by reducing renewable energy, uh, by using renewable energy sources and energy efficiency measures uh, in public buildings since renewable energies represent a natural competitive advantage for the Mediterranean area. The project plans and supports three cost-effective energy renovations of public buildings across climatic zones uh, in Greece, Tunisia and Jordan while monitoring the effectiveness of renovation using energy measuring devices. Greek pilot is a regional building in uh, Sparta. The Jordan pilot is the building of the Greater Irbit Municipality and the Tunisian pilot is a hospital building. Now two out of the three pilots are in the final stage of the renovation procedures. I will not go in further details uh, with uh, the energy renovations, but I have collected some best practices from our experiences so far. Thus resulting in five items which should not be missed when preparing a public building renovation. The first one is to build consciences by involving users in all renovation phases, pre-renovation, the renovation stage, and post-renovation, and train the users and the general public in energy efficiency measures. The second one is to use key performance indicators for optimizing energy performance, including not only conventional indicators, but also KPIs for renewable energy sources, for example, green factor, which is a fraction of energy used for renewable energy sources divided to the total energy consumption, and other co uh, users' comfort indicators, etc. The third one is to record the energy behavior and profiles of the building users with the use of questionnaires and interviews. This is critical since users significantly influence the final energy consumption of a public building. A unified protocol for recording the habits of building users should be developed to estimate the type of users, high energy, medium energy, low energy consumers, and to adapt uh, the next phase, which is the educate and train phase. The fourth one is to define the energy upgrade scenarios, which includes the definition of the renovation type and scenarios to be examined for public buildings. And finally, the fifth one is the development or adoption of an energy management system to monitor and control the building's energy needs. Sorry. But what is our plan for the engagement of building users? First of all, we involved building users from the pre-renovation stage when we developed uh, the energy studies. In total, 609 respondents participated in the survey. One survey has been conducted per pilot uh, site. Uh, and in the vast majority, they agree that sharing the amount of energy consumption with employees is important for saving energy. During the renovation phase, we produced two videos on what to do to reduce energy consumption in the office building where they work and the role of the e-tool for energy monitoring in the energy consumption reduction. And we informed users on the renovation actions. Finally, since our goal is to enhance and promote an ecological use of public buildings, abiding by their traditional use and role in the, in the community, six trainings are going to take place after the renovation actions in the post-renovation stage. Among others, the building users will be trained in the use of the e-tool, which will allow the interconnection with the energy measuring devices of the pilot buildings and will be used for the monitoring of the energy consumption of the buildings and for sharing messages for increasing the energy gains. The e-tool will allow access to the building users to monitor energy flows, energy consumption, and demand and supply of energy because all pilots are using photovoltaics as a renewable energy source. It will also facilitate building users' acceptance and commitment. It is expected to reduce energy consumption and energy costs and to facilitate the decision-making process for the energy intervention measures in the buildings. Finally, the visualization of comparison analysis through charts 
uh, will allow the certification and validation of savings in an objective way and make the energy management process even more comprehensive to the building users. Finally, our motto is to embrace user involvement in all phases of the renovation project. Thank you all for listening and for your attention. I think the timing was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So one, yet again, another aspect and the importance of also involving um, the users um, because they, at the end of the day, are occupants of the buildings and if they are not convinced and cannot contribute, then um, many of the things fall apart. We also heard about the importance of having energy management systems in place um, that can very much contribute in this sense. So with this, um, we are now going to Rosa Schina, who is project manager at the National Association of Italian Municipalities in Tuscany. So yet another of those beautiful um, Mediterranean countries and uh, who will tell us about the Sole project. Uh, the floor is yours. And if you could also stick to the time, that would just be perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea and Alejandro for this opportunity. Uh, Sole project supports uh, cost-effective and innovative energy rehabilitation of seven different public buildings in Mediterranean area. Um, beside this pilot, uh, in order to reduce uh, building energy consumption, SOLE will also intervene at two other levels. Uh, first, by encouraging uh, behavioral change in people through at green campaign. Secondly, by impacting on local policy through lobbying and advocacy to integrate the pilot results in relevant policy frameworks. My presentation will focus on capitalization process inside SOLE project. Next slide, please. Through its uh, capitalization activities, uh, SOLE will seek to influence uh, policymakers in charge uh, of the energy sector at two different levels, local level and wider level, so Mediterranean or European level. Next slide, please. The continuous capitalization process uh, will be achieved uh, through structured activities uh, facilitating the efforts of policy and decision maker to address the problem on environmental impact of building energy users and to achieve compliance with relevant regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, as already said, uh, capital capitalization is structured into two main strains of activities. Uh, Sole want to impact uh, on policy at local level in each country, uh, partners create a policy working group with key local stakeholders. Uh, then, uh, Solar Project wants also to impact at wider level, integrating solar results into cross-border recommendations. This work uh, is designed to deliver a strategic vision, designed to influence uh, all major decisions concerning uh, green building rehabilitation. As with local e policy impact, this is achieved through a cross-border stakeholder group and two large capitalization workshops. Next slide, please. At this stage of the project, we have uh, prepared one report for each project area. We have seven different countries that agree to participate to SOLE project and uh, seven different reports have been produced in order to make uh, a clear picture of the main key aspect related to energy requalification of buildings, of public buildings policy at local level. Next slide, please. I try to summarize the main results of this analysis. As also other speakers said before me, the energy situation in the Mediterranean area is critical considering that the countries facing the MED are characterized by an old heritage or an old building heritage. Lack of intervention over time have led to high summer and winter energy needs in building, increasing annual energy consumption and carbon dioxide emissions. By the other side, the Mediterranean area is characterized by culture and construction methods and thanks to geographical position, there is a strong potential in the use of re renewable energy resources. The main local policies in Mediterranean countries has two different types 
of scope in order to reach the goals related to the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. First, encouraging the uptake of alternative resource of energy from fossil fuels, so for example, renewable resources. Secondly, by reducing energy consumption, for example, stimulating through economic incentives the installation of more eff efficient conditioning system and the thermal insulation of buildings. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact in the delays of the work on uh, related to energy requalification of buildings and also the war in Europe is uh, you know, rising the prices of raw materials. The lack of supply of natural gas to Europe from Russia have stimulated all Mediterranean countries to work on energy efficiency, especially in public and government buildings. Most of the central government of Mediterranean countries has established countermeasures to gas crisis in order to reduce energy consumption, for example, limiting the temperature and hours that in public of uh, that um, of energy consumption in public and government buildings, limiting the time of shopping malls, uh, reduce the public lighting in streets. In case uh, we have two different types of situation in Mediterranean, for example, there are uh, countries like Egypt, where there is a surplus of natural gas and all the above measures are in order to reduce the amount of natural gas used in power generation plants in order to export this gas to Europe. On the other side, there are countries like Italy where uh, uh, the, the, the energy reduction, the, the gas energy consumption are related to the fear that uh, there is not enough gas for the winter season. So that's next slide, please. That's all for my presentation. Please uh, find out more about Solar Project on our social channel and also on our website. Uh, website. Thank you for the attention. And uh, again, Alejandro and uh, Andrea for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Rosa, for taking us. Uh through your project, um, a very um, lively presentation of what you're doing um, from an Italian perspective. And that brings us to uh, the last uh, success stories in success story in this round, um, where we will have uh, Osama Sadeh, who is associate professor as at the German Jordanian University, who will tell us about the ESMES project. And there, if I'm not mistaken, schools will be in the in the center and play a very important role so i hope you'll show up on the screen in a minute osama the floor would be yours good morning everybody good morning we hear you Hello. but we don't see you for now ah there you are perfect <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So um, I'm going to be talking today about the design of uh, customized PV systems, uh, what we call data-driven uh, PV systems for buildings that have um, uh, what we call nonlinear loads. It's a new way of designing uh, PV systems. This is one of the activities of the SMS project, which is the energy, uh, the... Uh, I don't see the slides. Are you, can you guys see the slides? Are they, uh, are they up? Yes. So uh, uh, this is part of the activities of the Energy Smart Mediterranean School Networks. Um, next slide, please. So what, what is the need for data-driven PV system designs? Over the last decade, there has been tremendous growth in renewable energy penetration on uh, electrical grids around the globe. And uh, the traditional way of designing these PV systems, which relies only on annual energy demands uh, and averages, is causing major power quality issues uh, to the power generating companies and the power system operators. As you can see in these two figures, uh, the way uh, we consume energy is very, very dynamic. It changes uh, within, uh, you know, uh, over a few, uh, over uh, the whole day. Uh, the top figures show how it's changing over an hour, and the bottom figures uh, showing how it's changing dramatically. So we have to take these in consideration when we're designing our renewable energy systems to not be a burden on the national grids that we have. Next slide, please. 
So one of the solutions for this is when designing a PV system, not designing it as its own entity, but designing it with the power grid in mind. And when we're doing that, what we're doing is we're designing the PV system with what we call power quality equipment uh, at the same time, uh, keeping in mind how the load is dynamically changing. This requires that we understand the connected load we have, which, does, uh, which requires detailed load characterization. With the SMS project in the five uh, countries, we're working with 34 different schools. And what we want to do is uh, measure those different characteristics of these different schools and then uh, choose a subset of those schools where we actually do our pilot programs. And uh, uh, next slide, please. So what we did is we installed what we're calling an online platform. And what this is, is this is a server that has the appropriate software to gather information from those four, 34 different schools in the five uh, different uh, countries. We're gathering that information about energy consumption, about power quality, about uh, energy, about current voltage, all these different characteristics that tell us how uh, the energy is being used at those schools. And uh, these, uh, the system uh, generates reports that shows us how this consumption is changing. And we're using those results uh, down the road. We'll talk about it in a second. So can you go to the next slide, please? So this is a sample of the data acquisition systems that we've uh, been able to install at these different schools, at the 34 different schools. Uh, if you look at the figure on the left, you can see uh, the, 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 you know, the addition that the system that we have, this is the data acquisition system. You can see on the front of the panel, this is what we're calling the power analyzer. And you can see the wires going to the panel on the figure on the right. So it's going to the direct, to the, you know, school's electrical uh, power uh, system. And we're measuring current voltage, all these different things uh, locally. We're processing that data locally. We're storing that data locally, and then we're forwarding that data to the online platform where all the partner uh, researchers and the partner institutes can have access to that data. So we are getting all this detailed data, and we've actually been able to share this data with some of the stakeholders in the different countries through what we're calling our national energy hubs. And even the electric companies are surprised at how much details we have, which is typically not available even to the electric companies. Uh, next slide, please. So we're taking that data and uh, uh, part of the SMS activities is actually using that data to do the data-driven design that we talked about. So we took that data and you can see in the figure in the middle, uh, we're using that to design what we're calling an optimized PV system. And what this optimized PV system is, is we're looking at sizing the PV system to be in harmony with the other equipment we have, which are the power quality equipment, such as the voltage regulators, the storage systems, the power factor correction. And we're doing this to have a better uh, you know, integration of all these different equipment at these public schools. So instead of having just a PV system that's generating uh, during the day, but it's affecting the power quality and that could turn off sometimes when you have these uh, nonlinear loads. And we're talking about vocational schools where we have these nonlinear loads that act very differently than what we would uh, typically see in a residential building. Uh, we come up with this uh, really nice uh, figure that shows us how we zoom in uh, to an accurate uh, PV system uh, size that's an optimized PV system size. And uh, this optimization tool is also part of our uh, activities at ISMIS. Uh, we've completed the PV system design phase, and now we've uh, started with the infrastructure work. So you can see the figure on the left is part of the infrastructure work that we're adding to these schools to be able to uh, better uh, receive the renewable energy um, systems that we're installing. So we've already started uh, based on the work that we did with the data-driven systems, uh, upgrading the schools to be able to accept the, the PV systems that we're dealing with. And um, you know, the picture on the right is showing you one of the schools that we're working with. And uh, uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Osama. And that was the fifth of, um, of, those, uh, of this first round of success stories. I think what we all heard very loud and clear is the importance of data and also the power of uh, digital solutions, data management systems, whether this is about monitoring, understanding what's going on in a building, influencing the behavior also of the occupants of the buildings and also dealing with fluctuating and intermittent uh, renewables. So I think really a very good overview of what can be done and what can be achieved. We are a tiny little bit behind schedule, but it's still manageable, I would say. So I would, before handing over to the next round of success stories, um, I would like to take the opportunity of this combined um, knowledge of um, all of you working on those projects 
and ask you a question, which is um, you have all worked with public authorities, uh, different types of public authorities uh, throughout uh, this topic. Working with public authorities is sometimes a challenge and comes also with specific requirements and specific ways of working. So my question to you would be, how did you convince the public authorities to go ahead with the renovations, with the various renovation ideas and models that, uh, that you tackled? What was it? What was the magic thing that really kicked it off and got them on board? floor is yours. I don't know who wants to jump in first. And maybe we have a cultural difference <laughs> there as well between the different uh, regions in the world. Maybe just a, a word <coughs> taking the, the, the presentation of the project of Marina. Training. You have to train uh, personnel or the public authority uh, just to, to, sh to not be worried about the news. <laughs> <laughs> I think that <laughs> certainly it's makes it's sense. It's a key step. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, it's difficult to talk. It's difficult to, to make them understand the benefits that you, you can achieve yeah. with uh, different kind of solutions. Communication, Communication training, okay. awareness yeah. raising, that's certainly true. Yeah, as you can understand, for us it's the same. <laughs> the point is to show them uh, which is the difference between the do-nothing scenario, different scenarios uh, with the use of uh, indicators or whatever, and also to show them best cases, uh, especially when the cases are similar to their own uh, buildings, the buildings that they are managing, uh, then I think that uh, this is the best uh, solution to convince anyone uh, to be part in this process, to take part in this process. Yeah, I guess that's even true for, I mean, that's true for any authority um, and any even private sector entities, training, education, explaining how does it work. And in our case, it, I agree with Yanni and with Marina. I think the, the best way to combine them is by showing them results. And also they need to be provided with uh, tools because sometimes there's like the main barrier <coughs> to, to face some challenges, at least in our case. Yeah, right. I don't know if the people on who spoke on the screen, if they can um, chip in as well. Do you know that, Alejandro? Enter, I don't know. Ah, Rosa can intervene, I'm being told. So, Rosa. I agree with other speaker. I think uh, one of the best uh, ways of uh, communication is uh, showing similar cases uh, uh, related to, to the one when where we want to intervene. Uh, I think also that even more in this uh, historical moment, the main leverages as, uh, for energy rehabilitation of public buildings are related to economic incentives uh, and the prospect of reduced uh, energy costs over time through energy efficiency. Uh, even more uh, uh, stimulating the installation of, ev of energy monitoring system can be a great support. Significant energy savings can really be achieved by simply having full knowledge of what the users use as partners of uh, the building. Thank you, Rosa. And I'm being told Osama has what also would like to intervene. One of the things Osama? I think is, yes, one of the things I think is very important for understanding, for actually conveying the message to these different government organizations that this is actually, there is no uh, downside, it's all upside. So with these systems, energy efficient renewable energy, first, it is a actually very, very, very efficient system that is very good for the environment. At the same time, you have a lot of uh, benefits uh, financially. So a lot of these solutions, you know, you're doing something good environment, but it's costing a lot of money. The payback period is very long. It's not the case here. Uh, here we have these solutions that have very good return on investment, very fast, uh, uh, you know, uh, investment recovery times. And at the same time, it's, uh, uh, you know, good for environment. So the big issue is a lot of these government organizations think it's too good to be true. So that's why it's very important to convey the message that it's not too good to be true. It's actually a very good solution that has no downside to it. So I think conveying that message is one of the, you know, the major ways that we get people involved and get people on board of what we're suggesting. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much for, for those insights. And I think also explaining that um, there are significant savings over the lifetime and the running of uh, equipment and during the operational phase, even if there may be a capex in the beginning. So, so also this, yeah, this uh, conflict we sometimes see. Okay. 
So, um, so I think we, yeah, the takeaway here is you all did great jobs in this convincing, <laughs> in this convincing theme. It's about uh, information, it's about awareness raising, it's about training, and it's about using tools also to show the benefits that can uh, result from it and also the savings that can result from it. And then I'm told um, that uh, it's uh, Antonella's video afterwards and I hand over to Alejandro. Thank you very much. Thanks to you all. So, so far we've seen uh, five projects and how they did, but we told you that we will show you six projects. So we are going with the next one in which we are going to travel to different sites. Uh, this sixth project is the Med EcoSur project, uh, whose aim is to uh, enable a cost-effective renovation within university buildings. So they, they have done renovation in three different sites uh, where we are going to travel right now. And we will start with Italy. Uh, we will meet Antonella Trombadore, who is professor of um, environmental design at the University of Florence. She holds a PhD as architect, and she's specialized in, f in the fields of sustainable architecture, responsive design, green ar uh, architecture for resilient cities. Uh, unfortunately, apparently there is a problem with the connection, but we have a backup video so we can see uh, what they are doing. Uh, so we are going to travel to Florence, uh, to the main cluster of the historical building of uh, Santa Veridada, which was built as a convent in the 14th century, and na na nowadays is the School of uh, Architecture. So if we can launch the video. Welcome to the Medeco Shure pilot site in the School of Architecture of the University of Florence. We are in the main cloister of the historical building complex of Santa Verdiana, built since the 14th century in the heart of the UNESCO city center. This block was being selected as pilot for the energy renovation action in the framework of the medeco Shoe project. Here, a living lab has been set up to experiment with an innovative and eco-sustainable renovation process. The name Bix Lab Building Environmental Experience underline the centrality of human behavior, as well as the key rule of people and their experience inside the building. The Living Lab helps to bridge the gap between stakeholder and end user, stimulating a positive dialogue to produce innovation. For this reason, we have engaging academic with experience in different files and above all, the students. The focus is on development of digital twins by combining building formation modeling and real-time and dynamic environmental data that influences indoor comfort thanks to a continuous monitoring system. Pending from the ceiling, you can see temperature and humidity sensor and globometers. On the wall, sensor of lighting level sensor of CO2 levels, flux meters to measure the thermal flux across the envelope elements, both opaque and transparent. We are also connecting external site-specific environmental data from our weather station. Moreover, we are also collecting qualitative data and end user feedback with an online questionnaire on the perception of indoor comfort to be combined with prediction of simulation and monitoring output in order to enrich the digital twin. You can also see the IoT LED system. It was the first installment of energy renovation project. We decided to install a large number of lighting and monitoring devices to explore different use scenarios. Every five seconds, environmental data recorded on a server it is possible to have a first visualization using an open platform. On the left, you can see the graphic representation of the daily data related to the different environmental parameters. And on the right, you can explore the BIM model. In the framework of the participation of our university to the European, new European Bauhaus program, the last year, we organized an international workshop engaging architectural students in the co-design of several renovation scenarios by exploring the build model for the simulation of the energy performance. Now, the final scenario is under realization 
it foresee the addition of a three-dimensional structure to protect the south facade, to control the solar radiation, optimizing shading and daylighting inside the room. Also producing renewable energy, integrating innovative amorphous silicon photovoltaic panels. The future activities in the Living Lab are addressed to develop an user-friendly platform, not only for the visualization, but also to stimulate the interaction for both facility manager and end user. In this way, it will be possible to augment the awareness of the people on energy efficiency in building, stimulating more proactive behavior for well-being in university spaces. Thank you. Uh, I think that we can still talk with uh, Antonella for, uh, for a while. So we, we saw your video. Uh, hello, uh, Antonella. We managed to see the video, but uh, we couldn't see that, like, uh, make the, the visit online. So I, I, I wanted to ask you one question, because you talk about a digital twin, and I would like you to explain us what a digital twin is. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for the question. Uh, the digital twin uh, is based on a virtual model of the building, creating by BRM, so it is a methodology to create uh, a virtual space of this. But also, uh, it's very important to, to implement uh, uh, this model with the real-time and dynamic data uh, collected by many sensors and IoT. Uh, in this way, it is really possible to realize a completed, uh, a very rich picture of the building, not only reproducing the energy environmental performance of the envelope and of the building, but also uh, valorizing uh, the rule of the people, introducing uh, many data coming from the feedback of the people inside, and special many data come from the experience uh, of them uh, in the living space, uh, integrating their perception of indoor comfort and also engaging the end user, the student and the other researcher toward awareness for the real view and approach of sustainability and implementing their proactive behavior. So the digital twin uh, will allow us to create a very uh, interaction between the physical space, the living space, and of course, uh, the feeling of the people. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, so Alejandro. we know how, uh, how important it is to gather data if we want to foresee uh, what our uh, renovations will, will bear if we do them. Uh, so our next stop is in Tunisia, and we're going to meet uh, Afef uh, uh, Abdelgani Benani, who is associate professor of the National Institute of Applied Sciences. Yeah, okay, uh, of Applied Sciences uh, and Technology. Uh, her research interests include fault-tolerant power systems, multilever converters, and power electronics for renewable energy and mobility systems. I'm, I, I've been told that we will first play the video and then we will connect with them since there seems to be like some, some connection problems. So let's play the video of AFEF. Good morning, everyone. We are proud today to present you the first Tunisian um, platform on microgrid that is based on a PV generation and distributed storage system that can be used for both uh, con grid connected system and isolated area. This platform named SmartNest, a smart microgrid platform with an energy management system, is implemented in our National Engineering School of Tunis and NIT in our research group lab in the frame of Medicushur project. The platform can serve for many purposes. First, as training and capacity building equipment to enhance the cooperation between our university and the socio-economic operators, mainly those working on innovative solutions with renewable energy integration. For example, the stake, our national energy provider, which is interested in such platform to test novel power electronics and renewable-based microgrids in urban and rural areas. Second, for academic activities, since many PhD and master students, as well as professors and researchers, are conducting their research on such topics and are interested in testing their fundamental findings on real microgrid platform. 
third for replication and scalability because such microgrids can be easily replicated in other departments of our university or even in other universities since one of the main goals of the Dicochon project is Mediterranean University to stand for a catalyst for a sustainable renovation. From a, a technical point of view, SmartNest has a capacity of around 15 kilowatt microgrid composed of a central system that you can see here with the needed power electronics and electronic equipment that creates a local power system to feed four satellites. Each of these satellites is emulating a real house. The central system is connected to a PV generation system shored by seven PV panels installed on the roof of this room and a central storage system with these two 2.4 kilowatt hour battery. The central system can be connected to the grid, like as you see here, or operate in a standalone mode, guaranteeing an energy feeding to the four houses since it is equipped with a smart energy management system. So we have four houses, each of them is fed by its own decentralized six PV panel. The first house, House 1 has, in addition, its local storage battery that you can see here. This is the battery of the House 1. Each of these four houses is called prosumer since it can produce and consume electrical energy from its own production or from the smartest local grid. Each of these houses has two types of load based on the level of necessity. First, the critical loads, named here by CAP, that have to be always fed for security reasons, for example, such as this lighting system in our case. The second are the non-critical loads, which will not operate in case of a problem on the local grid, like the home appliance system we have here. Smartness is monitored thanks to two online platforms. First, is the Julia platform used to monitor the central system and the overall energy consumption, storage, and production. The second one is SEMS portal platform, which monitors each of the four houses system consumption, storage, and production. SEMS monitoring system is also available on the smartphones connected to SmartNest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Afef. I don't know if I can, yeah, we can, we can see you. We know that the connection didn't work very well today, but we managed to see the video. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned the SEMS and your platform, so if I will understood, one is for managing the microgrid connection, and the other one is to manage um, how the microgrid is con connected to the, to the grid, to the na national grid, is it? Yes, in fact, Julia is the company that the Gamco Energy Company, this central uh, system, and it has developed its own portal, which is the Julia portal, and we are using this Julia portal here to, uh, to monitor and uh, store the data in the cloud, the data corresponding to the energy uh, uh, transmitted uh, in the smartness in the cloud. Uh, on the other hand, Sam's portal is the Goodwe portal. So the Goodwe is the uh, company that developed these inverters, these satellites, and their, uh, their uh, portal is used to monitor and store also the data corresponding to the energy transmitted in each of these satellites. We have four satellites, so four for prosumer. And we, we can connect to, uh, to SAMS portal via our um, uh, computers or via our smartphones, in fact, uh, and to, to, sh to, to see the transmitted energy consumption, storage, uh, production, etc., in real time, and after we have uh, access to the data, in fact. Thank you very much, uh, Afef. So let's go to the last uh, step of uh, our trip. So we are going today to 
Palestine uh, to the An Naja National University of Palestine, where we'll meet Fida Salame, who is a, a senior electrical engineer uh, with a broad experience in developing solar po power plants. But today, she's not going to show us a plant, but rather a tree. So le let's see in the video what this, what this tree is about. Hello, I'm uh, Engineer Fida Salame from Al Najah University. Uh, we are here at the located uh, of, uh, at the site of uh, Solar Tree, which uh, was implemented at the front yard of the new campus of Al Najah University under the framework of, of, uh, of uh, medical solar project. Uh, the medical solar project has uh, a major role in promoting the. Uh, in promoting the, uh, uh, the concept of renewable energy application in Palestinian University. And we at Najah University have installed many solar uh, systems which contributed in reducing electricity consumption by 20% and also reducing the CO2 emission by 550 ton annually. In order to increase the awareness among university students and through medical solar projects, we have implemented a solar umbrella system so that students can easily charge their mobile and laptop, which will increase their awareness of the importance of solar energy. And the outdoor lighting of the gardens has also been connected to this system in order to achieve the most benefits of solar tree. The solar tree has been installed with capacity about 3 kilowatts and produced approximately 15 kilowatt hour per day to cover the needs of many students and to ensure the sufficient lighting for the outdoor garden of the university. The tree consists of three branches, each is connected to a four solar panels during the daytime when the su sunlight is sufficient to meet the load. The generated solar energy directly feeds this load. Any excess of solar energy is stored in battery. The results and lessons learned from the implementation of the solar tree will be shared with other campuses at the university to be able to replicate or scale up this project. Thank you, European Union and, and those in charge of any CBC medical program and Medric who is in charge of following up the implementation of the project and for providing the opportunity to implement this project at the university and to be as a model for other Palestinian universities. Thank you. Thank you, Fida. Uh, I don't know if you are there, but if not, uh, we are going to continue because we are a little bit tired of time. Yes, I'm yes. here. Yeah, well, we, we managed to, to see the video. Um, so do you plan to, uh, to build new solar trees or other, other kind of uh, solar installation in the campus? Uh, according to the high impact of installing the solar system in our university and, and through a medical solar project uh, in our university, we have uh, reduced the electricity by 20%. Uh, so the university is planning to replicate this pilot project uh, and other integrated UV system in our sites, in, our, in other uh, campuses of uh, university, and also to transfer this idea uh, to our to the uh, other uh, Palestinian university. Thank you. So we, we have seen this, and I think that one of the ideas that we must get from, from, from this connection is that solar panels must become part of our uh, urban settings, of uh, our uh, la uh, landscapes, and we can integrate so solar panels in a way that we will make uh, our cities and the place where, where we live and where we move uh, more sustainable and we will have uh, quick access to energy. So let's go with the last part of, of this uh, session. And as you know, we are in the European Year of Youth, so we didn't want to miss the chance to, to, uh, to tackle this uh, issue. So today we are having here uh, today a, a person who is going to talk about uh, what careers opportunities we have in the energy sector since this is a, I mean, we all know that uh, there, is a, there is a big opportunity now uh, and we will need to de develop a lot of things in the um, energy sector. So today we have uh, Suha Ferchiti uh, with a PhD in mechanical engineering and who is a young researcher at the Mediterranean Renewable Energy Center in Tunisia who will talk about career opportunities. 
Suha, the floor is yours. Thank you. What, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction and for this opportunity to join the event. Uh, so, um, I chose to pursue a career in the energy sector, actually when I was in my final year of uh, engineering studies in Tunisia, and it started when I had to choose a topic for my graduation project, as, as uh, any other student. So for me, it was a tough choice between biomechanics and sustainable energy systems. So at that time, I uh, consulted with some of my professors and family members, which led to my to go with sustainable sustainable energy systems as a focus for the next chapter of my academic and professional life. At that time, I was very much convinced of the simple yet very relevant idea that we live in an environment where everything, including our work, our culture, economy, etc., relies on the use of energy. So we can be um, involved in many, many ways, starting, for example, from the technical aspects, such as the design, consumption, and operation of these energy systems, until the uh, aspects dealing with sustainable and socioeconomic development when, for example, focusing on clean and affordable energy matters. Furthermore, along with the growth of the world population needs and also the comfort standards in all over the world, and in particular in some of the emerging countries, such as in Asia or Africa, the energy industry was growing very fast. And also the career path was getting higher or opportunities were getting higher. And so this was a very much important aspect for me because I had to secure a job for myself also in the future. So uh, this employment rate is growing and will continue to grow uh, based on a, um, a report that was published by the International Renewable Energy a Agency, ERENA, in 2021. So as you can see in these, these figures displayed in here that among Sorry, other technologies, energy efficiency is an important pillar of the energy transition and has employment, as stated in the report, uh, particularly between 2020 and 2030, which is reaching above 45 million jobs by 2030, and renewables also would contribute with 39 million jobs. So uh, throughout my career, I have been involved in EU-funded cooperation projects, which start I uh, since 2014, yes, uh, since 2014, and these projects uh, address common challenges such as climate change mitigation and adaptation and socioeconomic development. So among this project, I can, I can see now, I, if I have to go this way or, oh yes, it does, okay. This one? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so among these projects, I can mention uh, RECOOP, which stands for Renewable Electricity Cooperation, which is a project funded by the uh, Framework Package 7 program. I can also mention uh, CCAP for Sustainable Development Goals and Medical Sure, which was uh, just presented by our partners now. And these projects dealt among, any, uh, among, of course, other aspects with the uh, development of novel solutions and actions and strategies for the uh, generation of electricity based on renewable sources and also for the renovation of the public building stock, mainly in the Mediterranean area. So I have, um, I would say that the big advantage of working on uh, this type of projects and uh, sector in particular is that you get to learn a lot of things at the same time, which contributes enormously in building your competencies, of course, compared to other types of, uh, of, uh, of jobs. And uh, I, would look, uh, I would like also to add that uh, the career growth pace is quite rapid. It's really rapid in this, uh, in this sector. And so this makes it much, much easier to access and fit in the global job market. I have also noticed that this sector involves a wide range of disciplines and of backgrounds, starting from engineering to architecture, economy, phys physics, chemistry, etc. And um, I have been working on uh, these, I mean, these cooperation projects, including medical sure, Sika for recoup, and have been involved with these people, which turned out to be very essential for the successful implementation of the projects in uh, in question. 
So um, these are some photos that were taken while I was working on these cooperation projects and with members that I am still in uh, contact with till date, which I particularly uh, cherish. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I would say that overall energy is a sector where knowledge, technology and even challenges are common all over the world. With, of course, some particularities in each country depending on the uh, natural resources available, on the legal framework and the energy standards imposed. Uh, also, this sector, in or in this sector, there are always opportunities to innovate as the sustainable energy and clean sorry, and clean affordable energy are quite of interest currently. And so I think, in my opinion, that the focus should be more on preferences and skills rather than on disciplines and background. So finally, based on my personal experience and seeing how things are rapidly changing and expanding in the energy industry, I can confidently say that this sector is offering and will continue to offer a vast range of career paths, especially for youth in Europe and outside, with plenty of choices and opportunity. And if I may conclude with uh, a thought that my uh, colleague Ines, which is uh, <laughs> sitting right there from Medrac, to say that we can consider energy and culture as universal sectors by excellence, <laughs> which we should target and take advantage of in a positive way, of course. Thank you for listening. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a wonderful pitch for, uh, for the energy field. So, um, so who, is not who has not been convinced up until now is, uh, is convinced now, I hope. And after, after seeing all of those wonderful projects, I think it's also it was a very convincing demonstration of what uh, can be done in terms of making our buildings resilient and also in terms of um, reducing the emissions and reducing the energy use. You said something very important, there is energy efficiency which short term can really make a tremendous gain and we really need it now with the winter um, also uh, ahead of us. And then it needs to be combined uh, with the uh, renewable energies in all the various shapes and sizes and forms um, that we saw. I think we also heard about the very big importance of data and of digital and of the m major opportunities this offers to us in terms of in terms of handling the energy, in terms of monitoring and measuring, and in terms of making sure that we use energy when it makes sense to use it, and that it is timely and adapted um, to, to the needs. So we do have a super opportunity now, because this is Fit for 55. There are major files on the table that are being, uh, that are being revised and that are entering the final uh, stages of negotiation. So I can only appeal to the policymakers, if there are some in the room, perhaps. <laughs> To, to really, really get this right. The technologies are available, it's all there. We need to just deploy it. We need to make sure that people know about it. And the framework must give the certainty also that is needed to deploy all of that. We need to stimulate renovations, building stock, super important. And we also heard not stop at heritage buildings, even there it is possible. We heard a lot of different uh, examples. The minimum e efficiency performance requirements that are being proposed um, are sending a right signal, so, so let's continue in this vein, vein. We need staged and deep renovation to make this happen. We need to incentivize the public sector to really play a model role, and we heard all the examples. It is possible, just it's all about information, education, making sure people know what, what they are talking what they are hearing and what they are talking about. The skills to make it happen, I think your pitch uh, couldn't have been clearer. We need the skills to make this happen and harness the potential of the digital solutions that are out there. There is a lot that can be done with digital, be it BIM, be it energy management systems, be it building automation and controls. There is a lot that can be done in that respect. And that will bring us also to, op to consider not only the operational emissions, but the full life cycle emissions, and also um, the building material emissions at the end of the day, the embodied carbon and everything that goes with it. So we have a lot of opportunities. We have the right moment in time. We have a window open to act. Let's just get it done. And we heard it is possible. It's all out there. Let's just make it happen. And thanks a lot for organizing all of this. Um, it was a great pleasure to work with all of you. I was very skeptical in the beginning that we would manage to get this all done in this short time, but we did. 
we did it, and uh, all credits to you, Alejandro. You were very confident from the start. So thanks a lot to everybody for listening in. And um, I don't know if you want to say a few words to... No, nothing else. Just to thank to all the projects who accepted this uh, challenge to showcase their results here in Brussels. And we are happy uh, that, uh, to see that we are ha having results. Uh, thank you for the Global Alliance also for um, accepting to this uh, challenge as well. That was to showcase so many things in, in 90 minutes, but we, we made it. So great. Thank you very great. much to all, all, all of you for coming as well. Thank and you. go and visit the Global ABC's website yeah. for more <laughs> information and join if you yeah. feel inspired, yeah. which you hope. I hope you do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.